Aya cheke, te pewe neo lakakoe, Liz Ellis Wayne's Viane, Nila Piwalia, Nila Lepwangia. Hi, I'm Liz Ellis. It's my great honor to be here with you all this afternoon. I'm an assistant professor here at Princeton and a citizen of the Peoria Tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the State of the Nation address focusing on Native Americans. Um, we want to thank the Office of Population Research for supporting this lecture and for all of our distinguished and wonderful panelists for joining us here virtually this evening. In the interest of keeping things uh, short and simplified, I'm going to go ahead and introduce all of our panelists at once, um, and then they will speak um, in the order in which I introduce them. Um, and so I will just go ahead and dive right in. So our first speaker, C. Matthew Snip, is the Burnett C. and Mildred Finley Wolford Professor of Humanities and Sciences in the Department of Sociology at Stanford University. He is also the director of the Institute for Research in Social Sciences Secure Data Center and formerly directed Stanford Center for the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity. Before moving to Stanford in 1996, he was a professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has a, been a research fellow at the U.S. Bureau for, of the Census and a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. Professor Snip has published three books and over 70 articles and book chapters on demography, economic development, and poverty and unemployment. His current research and writing deals with the methodology of racial measurement, changes in the social and economic well being of American ethnic minorities, and American Indian education. For nearly 10 years, he served as an appointed member of the Census Bureau's Racial and Ethnic Advisory Council. Professor Noreen Goldman is the Hugh Rogers Professor of Demography and Public Affairs at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and a faculty associate at the Office of Population Research. A specialist in demography and epidemiology, she examines the impact of social and economic factors on adult health. She has designed large-scale surveys, including one focused on the determinants of illness and healthcare choices for women and girls in rural Guatemala, and an ongoing longitudinal data collection effort in Taiwan, focused on the linkages among social, environment, stress, psychological function, I'm sorry, physiological function, and health among older persons. She has also conducted research on health disparities among Hispanics. She has been a member of the board of directors of the Guttmacher Institute, a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and part of numerous committees on the Institute uh, of the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, and the National Institutes of Health. She is the author and co-author of more than 190 articles in population, epidemiology, sociology, and statistics. Beth Redbird is a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Northwestern University. She is also a faculty fellow with the Institute for Policy Research and the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Her work focuses on how between group boundaries affect interaction, conflict, and inequality. Among her research projects is The Unending Frontier, which focuses on invisible walls that restrict the movement of people of color, such as ghettos, barrios, Chinatowns, and reservations, which create boundaries while at the same time creating rich reserves of information, cultural intermixing, and power. She is also responsible for the Tribal Constitutions Project, whose purpose is to study the development of tribal constitutions and sovereign status through constitutionalism. Winona Leduc is a white earth Ojibwe and is an icon, anti, and an enduring force for justice within Indian country. For decades, Leduc has fought to defend Anishinaabe homelands and the rights of indigenous people across the nation and beyond. She is a scholar, organizer, writer, the author of many books um, and articles, and more recently, an industrial hemp grower. She's committed to preserving native homelands and fostering sustainable development and has critically shaped contemporary fights for food sovereignty and livable futures for native people across the nation and beyond. In her work, she combines a keen ethical impulse with a faith in social mobilization and the raising of collective awareness. In 1996 and 2000, she was a candidate for vice president of the United States and as a nominee of the Green Party on a ticket headed by Ralph Nader. 
She is the executive director and co-founder of Honor the Earth, a native environmental advocacy program that has um, played a huge role in the Dakota Access Pipeline and has been very active in a number of ongoing environmental struggles um, across the U.S. today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Matthew Siff. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Liz. I'm going to share my screen here in just a second. Okay, is that, does that work for everybody? Um, I'm going to focus on really providing a, a, a broad outline about how American Indians, who once upon a time were economically self sufficient people uh, and were transformed into modern times into um, a, a state of welfare dependency in many of these communities. So I want to begin by just sharing you with sharing with you a few um, maps uh, that were produced. These are these are screenshots from a, a, a web application that was created by Claudio Sant, who's a historian at the University of Georgia, and um, it's uh, actually it's a dynamic map that changes uh, over you know by month. But I'm just going to share with you a half dozen screenshots to, to kind of illustrate what has happened to Native people in in 48 states. And so here you see the native homelands as of about 1784, uh, which is, of course, around the time of the founding of the nation. Moving on, you can look up here and you can see the sort of outlines, the early uh, land sessions as uh, uh, the Americans began to push west. And then you see more of these land sessions uh, in 1824 as, as Americans continued to expand westward. Uh, and then in 1844, you see the first reservations being established. Uh, this is a city of Potawatomi and what was then the Indian Territory and later became Kansas. Uh, and now you start to see the use of reservations as a tool of federal policy for uh, dealing with uh, uh, recalcitrant uh, Native people who are refusing to give up their lands. This is 1864. Uh, 20 years later, 1884, uh, you start to see that this is the last remaining uh, native homeland, which has not been ceded. You start to see these with the growth of the reservation system up here. And then finally, what you have is this, these are these are native lands uh, from roughly 1897 to the present then. Uh, Navajo Reservation down here, which is the largest of, of the reservations in, in the system. So what these maps illustrate is, is, is what, my, what was once discussed as the Indian problem. And from roughly 1492 to 1890, uh, the Indian problem was a, a military uh, or a national security problem uh, with a military solution. And keep in mind, too, that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was originally housed in the uh, United States War Department. By the late 19th century, uh, the, there was a redefinition of the problem. And basically, people uh, who were concerned about the Indian problem, who thought there was a, a major problem for the United States, uh, didn't think of it as a national security problem as much as a problem uh, defined by how to humanely facilitate the extinction of Native people, because by 1890, the Native population had fallen to about 228,000 from a possible high of as, as many as uh, 7 to 9 million at contact. And so in the late 19th century, the United States uh, redefined the problem and adopted a two-pronged policy. Uh, one was for children, and the other was for adults. Uh, for children, uh, there were boarding schools. Uh, the first was established at, uh, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania uh, in 1879, and we still have a couple of boarding schools that are still around and operated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Most of them are now closed. Uh, but for adults, uh, there was the land allotment, and it was the idea of giving uh, Native people uh, land, uh, carving up the reservations, turning it into private property and with significant consequences. The aftermath of the boarding schools and allotment was that um, uh, it was boarding schools were basically designed to force the assimilation of native people. 
and to prepare them for a life of, of, of gainful employment by providing them with vocational training. And so in 1893, at the, at the apex of the boarding school movement, there are 156 schools with about 14,000 students. The consequences of these schools was uh, wholesale language extinction because these kids were not allowed to speak their native language in the schools. There was, of course, obviously a lot of family disruption as these children were removed from their homes and sent to the boarding schools. And one of the consequences, lingering consequences to this day, has been a sense of trauma and a historic antipathy uh, towards schooling. Uh, land allotment uh, was, as I said, about privatizing tribal lands. Uh, and it took tracts of land and a lot of them to individuals with fee simple title, which is basically the way most uh, private property is held in this country. And then the land that was left over was supposed to be sold to white settlers, which it was in, in large amounts. Uh, the consequences of allotment were massive land losses and uh, reservation checker, checkerboarding, which I'll show you, say a little more about in a second. Uh, so this is a uh, photo that was taken around the turn of the century. Uh, it's outside of a, of a mission boarding school, uh, and it, it sort of encapsulates uh, what the federal government and uh, various other organizations were trying to accomplish, and that was the extinction of Native culture. And you can see here that this traditions, and specifically Native traditions, uh, is the enemy of progress, and that was the sort of the prevailing uh, attitude uh, that it was embodied in federal policy in, in this period. Uh, the boarding schools, um, for a time in the early years of the boarding schools, it was widely believed that it was impossible to educate and civilize Indian children. And so what the uh, boarding school advocates did was that they liked uh, before and after pictures. And so they would bring these kids in to the boarding school uh, still in their native dress, and then they would uh, take up, that was, that was the before as they arrived at the boarding school. And then after they were at the boarding school for some time, uh, they would take another photo and that would show these kids uh, with uh, haircuts uh, and, and dressed in military uh, uniforms, which was uh, sort of a regular practice in the early years, years of the boarding school. And it was supposed to show that the boarding schools were in fact uh, able to uh, accomplish the task of civilizing native people. Allotment and severalty, uh, <clears throat> there was a, um, uh, there was a, a, a law, uh, it's actually the, the Allotment Act, which was passed in I think, 1887, uh, was, was an act that was designed to break up the reservations. And you can read at the top of the, um, uh, this quotation from Merrill Gates. Merrill Gates was uh, the president of the Lake Mohawk Conference. It was a group of reformers. Uh, progressive reformers, I might add, uh, who were concerned about the Indian problem, and they believed very much that the way to solve it was to, to give uh, Native people uh, land, to give them the title to the land, and then this sense of pride of ownership would somehow um, take root, and they would give up their, their old tribal ways and uh, take up uh, life as, 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 as uh, you uh, as Americans, uh, slightly slightly browner than white Americans. And so you can see the land, the kind of land loss so, that took place. So, you know, in 1881, uh, when the reservation system was, was pretty much uh, reaching its maturity, uh, Native people had uh, roughly 156 million uh, acres. Uh, over the course of uh, the period of allotment, uh, allotment ended in 1934, uh, that, that 156 million had dwindled down to 30 million. And if you think about this, I mean, if you think about how allotment operated in the sense that uh, provided title to uh, the land, uh, Native people very often when they needed cash would sell that land. Uh, it was frequently the subject of tax foreclosure. And then of course there was fraud. But if you think about land as, a, as an asset, then you have to look at this and see this as a massive, massive depletion of, of wealth. And here is a poster. Uh, this just shows the, you know, the, there were there was enormous amounts of money made uh, by these various title companies, land companies, uh, uh, taking land that uh, was supposedly surplus land from allotment, 
and then putting it up to sale for to non-Indians. Um, in the Oklahoma Territory, uh, or what was the Indian Territory, uh, there was uh, a large parcel of land uh, called the Cherokee Strip, which was ceded uh, to the United States government after uh, the Civil War as, as, as war reparations. And, the, um, and of course, many, you probably all know the story about the Oklahoma land rush. Well, they're, they're also in, rushing on land that was formerly uh, uh, belonged to the, tri uh, the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. And then, of course, this gets romanticized in, in modern times with this, this very, very successful musical written by Rogers and Hammerstein called Oklahoma. And there's scarcely a mention uh, at all about uh, how that land came to, came to be uh, uh, available. Oh, this is a, not a very clear copy of a, of, a, of a letter that my grandmother received back in 1909, shortly after she married my grandfather. Basically, what the uh, this Commonwealth Trust Company, whose mo motto is good dirt at low prices, basically what they're telling my grandmother is, is that if she will go and talk to the Indian agent, uh, they she will be able to sell her allotment. And the reason she wanted to sell her allotment was that she had the, her allotment was actually two tracts of land 10 miles apart in a time when 10 miles was a very far distance to travel in a place that uh, did not have uh, paved roads. Uh, or, or certainly not cars in this in this period. This is actually the uh, a map of the lack of Flambeau Reservation in northern Wisconsin, and it shows the uh, the, uh, the what, I, what I mentioned earlier as the checkerboarding pattern. And you can see that you know the white land is basically land that uh, is 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 um, a lot of land, uh, but it's still held in trust. It hasn't been sold. Uh, the uh, green land is tribal uh, land, and then the reds are basically it's privately owned uh, land. And this kind of checkerboarding and this kind of this very, very complicated pattern of land tenure uh, is presents enormous problems to tribal governments today uh, when they go to, to start talking about uh, planning developments for the reservation, uh, utility construction, and the like. So in post-war America, uh, there was, a, there was a, a change in policy. In fact, the change actually came during the Indian New Deal. Uh, this was an interregnum and forced assimilation. Uh, the Allotment uh, uh, Act was uh, uh, rescinded. Uh, boarding school curriculums were revised to be a bit less uh, repressive, but they still focused on assimilation. And then there was also, uh, and then after uh, World War uh, II, uh, we had the termination and relocation policies. And termination meant the unilateral abolition of tribal lands. Uh, there were uh, roughly 25, 26 uh, reservations that were terminated. All of them were eventually restored. Uh, and if I could just take a minute, the way the termination was done was that the BIA would go out and tell people that they had to participate in an election about the future of their reservation. And then the question was, do you do you agree that the reservation should be terminated? Uh, yes or no. And the way the votes were counted was that if people that yeses were yeses, and then anyone who didn't vote uh, was counted as no. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeses, noes were noes, but if you decided not to vote, uh, you were counted as yes. And so that's roughly how that played out. Um, there was also an effort to resettle uh, Native people in urban areas. Um, and the, you know, the relocation program moved about 100,000 participants into urban areas. Uh, they didn't all stay. And one of the problems of, of, of providing uh, uh, these relocate, relocatees excuse me, uh, with vocational training, you can bring them into the city, you can teach them, uh, give them a skill, but uh, the unions uh, were obstructionists and that there was also uh, just plain old uh, out and out discrimination in the 1950s against anyone who wasn't white. And native people were frequently uh, trained to be auto mechanics and there's something of a stereotype in parts of the country about how Indians are, are good auto mechanics and that's where, how this came to be. So where we land today, and I'm, I'm just about out of time, <clears throat> 
uh, is that uh, Richard Nixon uh, was actually very sympathetic to Native people. And he um, uh, sent a message to Congress in 1970, uh, and he used the, the phrase self-determination without termination. And then five years later, the Congress passed the American Indian Self-Determination and Educational Assistance Act, uh, which is public law 93-638. And what the Self-Determination Act uh, accomplished was basically to, to devolve uh, BIA oversight uh, over uh, reservations and, in fact, uh, put uh, tribal governments in charge of their communities. And then, of course, in the, the relocation programs were officially ended uh, by 1981, but they were starting to scale back even before then. So let's see if I can. Yeah. So that's where I end. And I want to thank you for, for, for your time. And I'm happy to answer questions later. So I'll pass it to Noreen. Okay. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, that looks okay. Okay. Um, so first of all, um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, and I'd like to begin my presentation by noting that unlike the other participants here today, I'm very far from an expert on the Native American population. Um, as a demographer and social epidemiologist with a strong interest in policy, I've been very interested in studying the impact of the COVID pandemic on disadvantaged populations. And so I began to explore this issue um, two year, about two years ago um, with a Princeton undergraduate who had lost her planned summer internship because of the pandemic. And she had explored health issues in the Native American population for one of her uh, required research papers at Princeton. Uh, so together with her, Catherine Leggett-Barr, and a PhD candidate in sociology, Fumia Uchikoshi, uh, we decided to provide the first national estimates of the impact of COVID on mortality in the Native American population. And I should note that in all the slides I'm going to show, not too many, um, by Native American, I refer to the combination of American Indian and Alaskan Native, which is the way um, the data are uh, presented um, in the various statistical um, monographs and online data sets. Okay. So what you can see a little bit uh, from the slide is that the media did pay um, a fair amount of attention to the impact of COVID on the Native American population, but it did so in a way that what I think was not terribly useful. That is, it focused on particular um, reservations rather than giving a broader picture of what was happening nationally um, in terms of the impact of COVID. Okay. Um, okay, so um, what I should, let me go back to the slide here. Okay, um, so a minority actually of Native Americans live on what are called tribal statistical areas, which is a designation a little bit broader than reservations, but roughly 70% of Native Americans live in urban areas, according to recent estimates, including the uh, 2020 census. So a focus specifically on reservations was obviously missing um, a good part of the population. So again, our goal was to say, what is the impact of COVID on mortality among Native Americans nationally? A very tricky endeavor, I should say. Um, tricky because all COVID data have been incomplete in this country, um, but that's been an especially severe problem for the Native American population. Um, so the substantial awareness among Native American experts, um, including, I'm sure, uh, my fellow panelists here today, as well as the CDC, that there are several severe problems with data for Native Americans. Those problems include the fact that some of the data are simply not being collected. In other cases, it's an issue of not being able to access the data or having huge delays in getting the data. And always there's the issue of errors in the data. So this article um, that I'll show you um, now um, just cites um, one expert, director of the Urban Health, Indian Health Institute um, at Gohawk, 
talking about how COVID data on Native Americans is a national disgrace. And one could apply that to many other aspects of data for Native Americans, uh, an ongoing problem and an especial problem, as this article notes, when you're trying to estimate the impact of a pandemic that we know had um, a severe effect on mortality and health in this population. Okay, So a particular problem that affects um, efforts to estimate mortality among Native Americans is that deaths are vastly underreported. Okay, so here's the issue. Native Americans can self-identify their race, their ethnicity on surveys and censuses, but they obviously can't do that on a death certificate. Right? Somebody else has to fill in that kind of information. So what happens often is the death gets reported as another race, often white, while the person is reported as Native American on the survey of the census. And when you put those two together and you get a death rate, those death rates are much too low. According to the CDC, probably about one third too low. So it's obvious that ethnic identification across the board is a fluid issue for many groups, but it's a particular problem when reporting is inconsistent between two data sources. So having said that, we forged ahead. Um, we estimated mortality to the best of our ability among Native Americans. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to present a few results from two recently published papers, one in 2021 and one a few months ago in 2022. Okay, so let me show um, the slide from the first paper. This is a paper that looks at death rates, deaths per people, um, taking into account something that's very important to demographers, namely that you control for the fact that different populations have different age distributions, and the older the population, typically the more deaths there are, and we, we want to control for that. So if we simply look at this panel um, that I'm showing here called age standardized, you can see that the death rates relative to the white population are far higher for Native Americans than either the Latino or Black populations, almost three times as high for Native Americans. These are COVID death rates adjusted for age for Native Americans relative to white. And a lot of media attention has gone to both Latino and Black populations, deservedly. But this is just pointing out that the situation um, is even worse if we were to simply look at COVID death rates for Native Americans. Okay. So next what we did was we looked at how these death rates compared with the proportion of Native Americans who are living on reservations across the 16 states with the largest Native American population. These 16 states that I'll show in a second cover about three quarters of the Native American population. And it's, it's not a great way to do things, but the problem is one couldn't use death data to determine whether a person lived on or off a reservation. That location information was simply not available. Okay, so here we are. Here we are with a scatter plot for 16 states with the largest um, Native American population, looking here across the x-axis of the percent of Native Americans who live on a reservation. On the y-axis, just think of it as a standardized death rate from COVID for Native Americans. Okay, and the obvious thing that jumps out at one is these things are pretty strongly related. The larger the proportion of Native Americans living in the state on a reservation, the higher their death rate from COVID. All right, so that, that's the main point here. Okay, and that occurred despite various mitigation strategies that were used in reservations during the pandemic, such as contact tracing, sealing borders, mass mandates, and enforcement of lockdowns. Okay, what I am not showing here for the sake of time is that these COVID death rates were also highly correlated across states with poverty, lack of health insurance, other than the Indian Health Service, multi-generational households, crowded households, obesity, diabetes, and being frontline workers, i.e. workers who couldn't work remotely. And these risk factors that I've just mentioned were also more prevalent on tribal lands than off tribal lands. So leading us to conclude that despite many efforts to promote awareness of COVID by tribal elders, reservation life seemed to encompass especially high levels of exposure to infection and ultimately to mortality, to death. Okay, so there are a couple of weaknesses with this first analysis we published because we were um, restricted to the data we could get. One is that death rates or standardized death rates are not easy to interpret. And the other is that we know the pandemic 
obviously led to a large number of deaths from COVID, but it also led to a lot of deaths from other causes, which are often referred to as excess deaths. That is, being infected with COVID could exacerbate pre-existing chronic conditions, often referred to in the literature as comorbidities, perhaps directly due to the infection or to the fact that people during the pandemic delayed healthcare or gave up getting access to healthcare altogether or had long COVID symptoms that affected other causes of death. So what we try to do is what demographers like to do, which is calculate life tables. I'll say a, a, a bit about that for those who aren't familiar with that. Um, so the idea is to summarize um, deaths in this um, calculation called the life table. But in order to do that, one needed the CDC or the National Vital Statistics Office to provide some kind of national life table for Native Americans that would take into account those correction factors that underreporting of death. And the first time they ever produced a national life table for Native Americans was November 2021. First ever. I mean, I find that absolutely startling. We've been using life tables for other populations throughout the 20th century. Okay, they produced it for the calendar year 2019. They put in correction factors, um, and that allowed us to go ahead and estimate the impact of COVID on life expectancy. And for those who aren't familiar with the notion of life expectancy, let me mention that what a life table does is it allows one to measure life expectancy, which we can think of as the years one could expect to live from birth onward throughout the lifetime if the death rates in a given year persisted throughout the person's life. And it's not affected at all by a population's age distribution. And it uses all deaths in a given year, not just COVID. So if COVID had a big impact on other deaths, that would be captured by this, by this kind of technique. Okay, so my former student, Teresa Andrusve and I uh, calculated the impact of the pandemic on life expectancy, looking specifically at the loss in 2020 and 2021. And before I show you those numbers, let me note that we began that exercise with the expectation, certainly the hope, that life expectancy in 2021 for Native Americans would be higher than in 2020 because of their successful vaccination campaign. Vaccination efforts that were culturally sensitive, such as having vaccinated community elders as role models that stressed the importance of maintaining Native American culture and preventing further suffering, combined with a steady supply of vaccine doses that were provided by the national government, helped uh, this vaccination campaign succeed. And let me show you in this next slide here, both the headlines pointing out that American Indians had the highest COVID vaccination rate in the United States. Um, and that continued to be the case with this graph on the right, where we look at the percent who had two vaccine doses, what we call, quote, fully vaccinated uh, throughout the period from February 2021 to November 2021. That's reason for optimism in terms of what happened in 2021. On the other hand, um, I've already noted that Native Americans have high rates of these comorbidities, other chronic diseases like heart disease, um, diabetes, diabetes, as well as hard to access and not effective healthcare that may lead to large numbers of excess deaths. Okay, and so before I actually show you the, the slide of what happened to life expectancy, let me show you this uh, rather simple figure that just takes the COVID death rates by age group. You can see the age down here, 2020 and 21 for Native Americans divided by the rate for whites. Um, and the point I want to make here is that young ages, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, those ratios are huge. That is to say, Native Americans in these young age groups had 15 or more times the rate, COVID death rates of whites in these young age groups. Um, and then it went down in 2021, which looks like another reason for optimism, but white death rates went up. So that really isn't as, as much of a source of, uh, of joy as one might think. Here's the bottom line, okay. Um, life expectancy as estimated for Native Americans um, by the CDC in 2019 was 71.8. I'm just showing now for both sexes, the circles in red. 2020, it dropped to 67.3. In 2021, it dropped further to 65.4. Okay, and um, a sentence in our article that got put into many forms of media, sort of there was the line that caught people's attention, was that these levels of life expectancy are far below those in every country in the Americas with the sole exception of Haiti, 
where estimated life expectancy is about 64 and several years below values observed prior to the pandemic in India, Pakistan, and Nepal. Um, I mean, that really is a disgrace to see life expectancies of that magnitude in a wealthy country. Um, so let me uh, show you, I'm close to um, concluding what happens when we put this, these estimates into um, comparison with the other groups in the United States. So the top purple circle is life expectancy 2019, green in 2020, blue in 2021, and these little triangles are just showing you the changes in years. But the point I want to make is life expectancy prior to the pandemic in 2019 was already far below Native Americans compared with all the other groups. Okay, we're talking about 17 year, um, seven, eight year difference with whites, 14 year difference with Asian Americans. By the time we're through two years of the pandemic, that gap between Native Americans and all of the other groups has really grown. Okay, so why was the loss in 2021 so large given the successful vaccine uptake? And here I list a few reasons. Um, we don't have a clear answer. One is that there was a surge of COVID in January and February before most people had vaccines, before many, almost anyone had vaccines. Two new variants came. They were very infectious, partly resistant to vaccines, Delta and Omicron. Um, the Native American population as the US population at large was resistant to obtaining booster shots. Um, deaths from causes other than COVID increased, including drug overdoses for a variety of reasons, and the reason why those impacts have been devastatingly large in 2020 and 2021 was the continuation of huge social, economic, and health inequities, including chronic diseases like obesity and diabetes that are risk factors for COVID, high rates of smoking, high rates of poverty, crowded households, high level of multi-generational households, poor infrastructure, including water infrastructure, weak and an underfunded Indian health service. Okay, my final slide says, what do we think will happen in 2022? And this is indeed very, very provisional. I, I shake even at showing something this provisional. Um, so this is just the first 10 months of each of these years because that's all we have for 2022. And you can see the sheer number of COVID deaths is lower this year up through October than it was in the previous two years, a very good sign. Deaths from all causes, barely different than 2020, okay? And a little bit lower than 2021, okay? What does that mean? What that means is um, the data suggest uh, perhaps we'll do better in 2022 than 2020. I don't know about, um, and, and, and better than 2021, I would say but nowhere near recovery to pre-pandemic levels. We still have a long way to go. And we may not see as large an improvement in 2022 as the number of COVID deaths suggests because of deaths from other causes continuing to rise for all those reasons I mentioned earlier. It reflects the high rates of comorbidities in this population, inadequate health care, and underscores the toll that COVID has had and continues to have on survival. Thank you. And my apologies if I had to go through that more quickly than you might have liked. Um, afternoon. My name's Beth Redbird. Um, I have a cold, uh, but I'm also an assistant professor at Northwestern. And um, strangely enough, I'm the director of the very cleverly named uh, Tribal Constitutions Project. And the Tribal Constitutions Project is uh, a cooperative action on the part of me, my co-author, who's a professor of constitutional law here at Pritzker's Law School, and then also in partnership with the NYU Yale Sovereignty Project. And I'd like to talk to you about it a little bit today. Um, so the Tribal Constitution Project is this effort to collect and annotate and code every constitution passed by a federally recognized tribe in the continental United States um, since you know, forever. And 
the neat thing about it is that it's an effort that came about entirely organically. Uh, it was not my fault, um, but yet it is turned into something that I'm really excited about the future of where it's going. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with tribal governance in general, uh, before the invasion of Columbus in 1492, there were thousands of sophisticated and complex governments on Turtle Island that had structures that you would recognize as constitutions. Perhaps the most famous of these in the North American context is enshrined in the Iroquois Constitution, which is also known as the Great Law of Peace. It's an oral narrative that documents the formation of the League of Six Nations. It's pictured here commemorated on wampum, which is a uh, manner of weaving that records history and commemorates important events. The constitution contains provisions that you would find familiar, such as an impeachment process for the removal of leaders from office, a bicameral legislator with procedures for passing laws, specific delineation on the power to declare war, a system of checks and balances um, for both the league and tribes within the league. And so it's a really great example of something that was actually really prevalent here on the shores long ago, which is this idea of tribal constitutionalization, which is not new. So the Tribal Constitutions Project started in 2018. Um, as a uh, interaction between a couple undergrads I was mentoring and the Library of Congress. And what it turned into was an effort on the part of a large number of partners, including the Native American Rights Fund, the Library of Congress, the National Archive, and dozens of law libraries, legal repositories, and contributions from a hundred tribal nations that donated documents that um, are arguably supposed to be kept and recorded in the National Register, but are often not. Since that time, we've had more than a dozen undergrads who've helped collect, clean, and catalog these documents. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have a partnership with the NYU Yale Sovereignty Project, and they have helped train more than 25 law students who are experts in both tribal law and constitutional law, and they engage in coding, annotating, and analysis of these documents. Um, today, we have more than uh, 1,200 of these documents in our corpus, and they represent more than 350 tribal nations. So before I brag a little bit about the project, which I totally will, I want to take a step back and I want to talk about why we might actually want to study tribal constitutions. And the first one is definitely for all of those of you in the room who are demographers, which is we're seeing a significant change in tribal demographics um, nationwide. In 1975, as Matt mentioned, Richard Nixon signs the Self-Determination and Education Act, which forms the basis for modern Indian law today. It was designed to address high poverty amongst Native nations, but in that time, poverty has consistently sat at more than two and a half times the national average. This despite big macro changes in US poverty levels in the last 50 years. So forthcoming research by me shows that this uh, poverty and indeed rising inequality within the native population is not equally distributed. Indeed, there appears to be some evidence that since self-determination, some tribes have been better situated to take advantage of these legal and institutional changes than others, increasing within native inequality. Now, during this time, we've also seen some other big changes. So for instance, today, right now, we have a larger native population under the age of 18 than we've seen in a century. And at the same time, we see tribes that have shrinking enrollment population numbers and are on the cusp of a tipping point in their population size. And to clarify how those two things can simultaneously be the case, I think uh, as Noreen pointed out, uh, data in tribal and native numbers are bad kind of across the board, but they're also difficult to align. So the census identifies Native American as a racial group, which means that it includes my estimation about three populations. The first is tribal members, members who are members of tribal populations. Uh, others who identify Native Americanly as Native American racially, and these can include the descendants of tribal members, but they can also include uh, individuals who identify racially as Native American 
uh, in the North American context for other reasons. And it also tends to include individuals who consider themselves to be indigenous, but are not uh, descendants of what we would consider to be North American tribes. And so those three populations are all caught up in the definition of Native American in most of our administrative data. And so what that means is that it can often be very difficult to disentangle what it means to be Native American in administrative data and Native American in a tribal sense. So we have these kind of big population changes that are moving in different directions. And those are really meaningful and significant for the ways in which tribal governments um, are going to engage in governance. But we also see then that this matters too, because right now is an amazing time. If we wanna address questions like access to services, access to infrastructure or education, or address the intergenerational transmission of poverty, the largest native youth population ever is right now. And so I would argue there is no better time. The moment in which we can have the biggest impact is right now. So compared to other sort of forms of inequality and poverty, we know very little about native inequality. And as both Noreen and Matt point out, this insufficient data is a huge cause of this constraint. Um, there's theoretical limitations too. Natives live in a unique and complex institutional context. They sit at the intersection of tribal life and broader US society. And this has complex causes and consequences for how we understand inequality and how we address inequality. Um, and there's relatively little research on tribal institutions and how tribal institutions come to be and how they work as institutions to address social need. So the second big reason why now is the time to study tribal constitutions is at the same time that tribes are changing, uh, the US tribal relationship is changing. So we've seen a big push at the national level to address indigeneity and colonialism as problems that are separate and different from race and discrimination. And this has resulted in some big important changes. Um, one obvious one is the removal of the mandate that the Department of Interior, that the federal government approve all constitutional provisions before a tribe can enact them, which means that tribes no longer have to ask permission to implement a constitution of their choice. But we've also seen backsliding in sovereignty and treaty rights, uh, including the very wonderful McGirt decision followed by the year later, a Castro Porto case, the pending concerns over ICWA. And these things have led to increased uncertainty about tribal rights at a national level. And as a result, we see uh, kind of an increase in tribal state government partnerships meant to ease some of this uncertainty. Um, and at the federal level, some other big shifts are starting to occur. So for instance, the first forced relocation of native peoples that will occur in the last 75 years is set to play place in the next few years due to climate change. And last week, the Biden administration passed I think $75 million to help aid uh, Native peoples who are being forced from their homeland by rising seawaters. Uh, we've also seen increased anti-Indian sentiment, increased violent crimes against Natives. Um, where I sit right now, the state of Illinois, uh, the state legislature next year is set to introduce more than a dozen new laws aimed at the protection of Native rights. But there's also ongoing here, a serious land back discussion taking place at the state level. And this is gonna be the biggest push for state native rights in Illinois history. And it's in a state in which there's no federally recognized tribe. So while we're seeing this big shift in what's going on within tribes, we also see this big shift in the relationship between tribal institutions and the federal government and tribal institutions and their states. The last one I will give you, if you don't mind me pulling out my soapbox, is that we are also in a changing world. And I don't have to tell you that we were all kind of confronted with our own uh, large amount of uncertainty in the last couple of years, inequality and climate change and other forms of social disruption. And these forms of social disruption are not new to tribes. Tribes are governments that have persisted and thrived throughout times of incredible social disruption and genocide. And understanding uh, how to deal with issues that concern a people and protect a people and create social justice is not new to tribal governments. 
Um, and I think that it's important for us to understand that tribes have something to contribute to the larger world. They aren't relics of a lost age. They're not something that we should look at just solely because it's important to understand tribes. They have something to say to both the national discourse and to the world. And I think that thing is really valuable. So um, I like to quote Felix Cohen, who's often considered the father of modern American Indian policy, in part because he worked for FDR's administration during the Indian New Deal. And he eventually went on to teach philosophy at Yale Law School. And he has this great quote, which I love a lot. As yet, few Americans and fewer Europeans realize that America is not just a pale reflection of Europe, that what is distinctive about America is Indian through and through. For it is out of a rich Indian democratic tradition that the distinctive political ideals of American life emerged. Universal suffrage for women as well as for men. The pattern of states within a state that we call federalism. The habit of treating chiefs as servants of the people instead of as their masters. The insistence that the community must respect the diversity of men and the diversity of their dreams. All these things were part of the American way of life before Columbus landed. Felix Cohen, Americanizing the White Man, 1952. So if I can take you back to this, this great law of peace, and remember the components of it and how they sounded so familiar, well, there was originally some historical disagreement, but most historians who study this constitution today agree that it influenced the structure and development of the US constitution. Founding fathers such as Benjamin Franklin were in regular contact with the Iroquois Confederacy and the great council of leaders was invited to address the Continental Congress in 1776. This is a form of liberal democracy, one which America would work to spread throughout the globe and it's entirely and inherently indigenous. The native, tribes and governments are by no means perfect, and yet they've made some incredibly important contributions to the world. More than 80% of the food that the world eats today was cultivated here. And to clarify, I don't mean that the food was found here. I mean that it was cultivated, what you might call engineered here by some of the earliest you know, agricultural engineers. Traditional indigenous knowledge has already helped to address local ecological disasters, both here and across the globe. Tribal governments are innovative approaches to a whole bunch of different institutions. They have different ways of thinking about social assistance and education and other institutions. And I think they have a lot to contribute to the world. And so that's my soapbox. So I will now return to the science, which is to say that the Tribal Constitutions Project has three primary goals. Our first is to map, explore, and understand the creation of tribal institutions. So we use kind of classic quantitative methods such as causal analysis uh, to understand the consequences and causes of native institutions. And then we use network analysis and diffusion modeling to understand how tribes make strategic decisions and how those institutions have diffused both this is important with between native nations, but also between native nations and local and state governments. Our second big goal is the creation of curriculum tools for both teachers and students. I don't think I have to sell you on the idea that we vastly under teach native studies in schools and most schools all together omit discussions of tribes as nations or modern tribal issues all around. And so our web portal, when it's live, will contain units on history and facts about tribal government and information. And we use computational modeling, most specifically neural networks that do text generation and summarization to help students explore the context and content of 1200 documents. But through the portal, we also are trying to provide a mechanism for tribes to contextualize their own constitutions and be the narrators of their own story. Rhetoric and misconception about these tribal institutions and structures has been used and weaponized against native sovereignty. Let me give you an example. So in the 1950s, uh, misconceptions about the way tribes own property was used during the Red Scare to help drum up public support for what Matt discussed, termination. And so allowing tribes to narrate their own history and governments in their own voice is important if we wanna understand sovereignty and tribal self-governance. Lastly, we're working with some qualitative legal methods to create tools for sovereignty affirming litigation. Um, and this is done in conjunction with the Yale Sovereignty Project 
we want to make tools that tribal leaders and advocates uh, can use and take into court to help assert sovereignty, claim treaty rights, and reclaim land. And this work is at the really, really early stages, but I'm really excited about where it's going, because I think that if anything should come out of these, it should be a tool for the nations that created these really amazing institutions to then have more tools at their fingertips to assert their rights and their sovereignty. So anyway, that's the Tribal Constitutions Project, and I'm happy to go into detail about parts of it if you have questions. Thanks. Terrific, thank you so much. And we'll now turn it over to our respondent, Winona LaDuke, thank you. Uh, hello, my relatives, nice to see you all. That was super interesting today. Um, and responding to you all, I was just say that uh, it was a pleasure to listen to all of your presentations. And I had to, I had to laugh because I was a little worried, Noreen, that I may be very close to expiring my life expectancy here, according to your data. I'm crossing my fingers. I'm going to make it. I'm accompanying my mother here who is 90. So fingers crossed. I still got a little bit in me. And uh, I did notice also, Beth, in your presentation, you had pictures of my tribal college. And I knew a lot of those students, you know, that were there. And that was that was a nice, a nice thing to see. So, you know, thank you all for your for your heart, you know, for your hard work and your and your good history lessons there, Matthew. You know, as I was as I was reflecting on what I wanted to talk about, I was I was thinking also that Beth, my son refers to this as Indian people as post-apocalyptic. He says, you know, we already been through the apocalypse, so we're like good. I mean, we 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 got a sense on this because we, you know, we're post-apocalyptic people. So I think about that sometimes in this time of the pandemic and, and this time that we are in. So let me just try to share some pictures and talk a little bit about this and uh let us pray. I got this down, this sharing and everything. I don't know. Can you see that? Yep. Good. Okay. So this is uh by Roy Thomas, an artist from my area. You guys are pretty astute. This is Nishinaabe art. It's called We Are All in the Same Boat, which kind of is how I look at the state we're in in the world. We're all a little bit different, but we all are in the same boat, you know, in the same moment here. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to move my PowerPoint. This is me, my life. Uh, I live in a place where you can still drink the water from a lake. That's my grandson and I were wild ricing. I live in a place where there's sugar from a tree and, and monomen or wild rice from a lake. It is a place of tremendous biodiversity. And this is us on wild rice lake, lower rice lake, uh, Don Goodwin and me. And I just want to say this because in the context of talking about the COVID pandemic, you know, the COVID pandemic is in itself a result of the loss of biodiversity because you don't get interaction with little guys like bats. You're supposed to leave the wild things where the wild things are. And the more that, you know, the UN has noted this as well, the more that you encroach on biodiversity and indigenous people, the more that you have opportunity for, you know, interspecies things that should not happen. You know, uh, we're used to things like swine flu and bird virus, but COVID was a whole new, you know, order of this. This is not a new situation, though. You know, I always like this, this little graphic here of long time, you know, uh, two different worldviews. And um, I think that Matt, you know, that um, the, the presentation we had on uh, in the history of, you know, policies is really reflected in that. But it is, you know, really these times that we are in now that, that you know, I want to talk about. And, and in our prophecies as Anishinaabe people, this is referred to as the time of the seventh fire, where it said we have a choice between two paths. One path would be well-worn and scorched, and the other one would be green. And, and so both of those paths are, you know, uh, in, in front of us, a, a scorch path and a green path. And I think that uh, we could see what the scorch path looks like. Um, it's all around us. It's a consequence of a lot of fossil fuels and a lot of uh, petrochemicals and a lot of scorching of the earth. But, you know, the COVID pandemic resulted in a time when there are basically uh, catastrophes of biblical proportions which surround us in all in all ways, whether it is the fires to the west or the polar ice caps melting to the north, where uh, Ms. Redbird was talking about how we're going to have, you know, ref climate refugees from the north, you know, in indigenous territories or the political disasters to the east, 
which have been pretty monumental in America, to the you know the storms to the south. Well, there's an intersection between you know all this in, in all of these and the pandemic themselves, a time of catastrophes of biblical proportions. Now, a lot of these pictures were already covered. The you know high incidence of COVID in the native populations, and I actually think this slide was up there, you know, um, with one of my previous colleagues' presentations. Um, you know, but what I want to talk about is is the it, you know the intersection of these issues. So this is the COVID checkpoint at the Ogala Sioux Tribe, and you know South Dakota, North Dakota. There's kind of a constant uh, competition between who's the most racist state. That's what I would say. You know, towards native people, it's it's neck and neck every year. Like during the Dakota Access Pipeline battle, North Dakota won it hands down. Thirty eight million dollars worth of military repression towards native people. That is a pretty big amount of racism towards native people. Now, South Dakota has given them a running and they have keep going on with it. So this is, you know, so the tribes in the face of the pandemic are trying to protect themselves by keeping people out. Because I know that they don't have infrastructure, they don't have hospital beds, and they don't need anybody to come to their community. So then what happens is the governor of South Dakota, this is one of the checkpoints, fear, fearful, you know, crazy looking bunch there, right? You know, these guys are just trying to stop more people from coming in their territory. And then you got uh, Christy Nome. That would be the governor of South Dakota, who is super anti-Indian and super racist. And this is um, Harold Frazier from the, uh, the um, Cheyenne River Reservation. And he put up a blockade and said, can't come in. Christy Noem said, I'm gonna call in the National Guard and President Trump because President Trump is my friend. You know, so what is the point of this? Is that when you already have a lot of racism in the state, you have a tribe trying to protect itself, or in this case, you had both OST, Oglala Sioux Tribe, and Cheyenne River trying to keep people off their reservation. And this woman is here trying to exercise her show of force to make sure that anybody she wants can go onto the reservation. That's how racism increases, you know, um, the, the problems that our, that our tribal nations face. And then, you know, in addition to that, she just has to, in addition to that, continue to, you know, exercise bad judgment and, and more racism towards Native people. Most, you know, recently after the Mount Rushmore incident, we had the... Uh, the uh, critical race theory is now banned from being taught in the state of South Dakota, you know, and the criminalization of marijuana after the tribes already passed it in the state of South Dakota. So what is my point? Is that in the midst of, you know, we could talk about healthcare disparities. We could talk about, you know, food uh, and nutritional issues, chronic diseases, uh, the lack of adequate housing, lack of adequate sanitation, those are all systemic issues that have to do with the history of treatment of Native people. And they are augmented by political conditions like these, which further repress Native people, you know, in our communities. And, um, you know, so what I want to say is we do, we continue our resistance. This is one of my favorite pictures. These are some women I know. They actually trained me. I was an intern. I used to work for these women. They were scary then, man. And so this is uh, Phyllis Young. Over here on the far right, she's from Standing Rock, and that is um, Madonna uh, Thunderhawk, and she is uh, um, from uh, Cheyenne River, and her sister Maple Ann Chasing Hawk, and I don't know who that fourth sister is. Now, this is a picture of four Lakota grandmothers stealing a Nazi flag that was in North Dakota in a small town that was purchased basically by neo-Nazis, and they stole the flag and they burned it. And so what I'm saying is like in the midst of what's going on with all of these crises in our communities, we are still resisting and we are still saying, you know, you are racist and we are not, and we're going to stand up. So look, um, in the, in the wake of COVID, what we had in Northern Minnesota was something called a critical infrastructure crisis. That would be where the state of Minnesota decided that it should allow a Canadian tar sands pipeline to go in during the time of COVID. So you had a lockdown and yet you invited in 4,500 workers from out of state <laughs> into Northern Minnesota, basically into native territories and you militarized it. This would be $8.5 million worth of military support or support for the police by the Enbridge Corporation resulting in the arrests of a thousand water protectors who are trying to stop this pipeline from going through. Now the pipeline is being forced through under the, under the critical infrastructure uh, times of, of COVID, that it's absolutely essential that you gotta have a, a tar sands pipeline in while you are uh, 
while you are uh, in a time of COVID because it's really essential. It's completely BS. But, you know, this is what the pipeline looks like. And this does not diminish health disparities, does not diminish health risks in any way in, in any part of our communities. This is the dirtiest oil in the world. And all of the risk is being borne by mostly Indian tribes in the Northern Great Lakes Territory who now have a six pipelines and a brand new line going across our territories by the single largest pipeline company um, in the world, Enbridge, 75% of the tar sands and the two largest oil spills in US history. So under the guise of COVID, you get more crazy that comes into your territory. Um, this is what it looks like on the ground. This is my experience in 2021. I spent a lot of time facing lines like this. And this is my arrest or one of my three arrests uh, that I faced in Northern Minnesota. I'm sitting over there on the far right in a lawn chair. And these are my grandchildren um, and some kids that live in my community that are all you know, standing there on horseback and watching this go down. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because in the midst of crisis, sometimes something beautiful is born. That's what I'm going to say. And so our community, faced with the crises of every other community, you know, realized that we had to try to do our best to try to come to terms with the reality that we all come to live in. And um, I really like what Erin Dottie Roy, the Indian writer, said. She talks about pandemic as portal. And she says, in the history of the world, Pandemics have always forced societies to change. This one is no different. It's a portal between one world and the next. And you think about that and it's true because every time there's a major crisis like a pandemic, we got to change. And we, all of us collectively, had no idea what to do. The uh, health systems, the technology, the food systems, all of which uh, collapsed during the time of the pandemic forcing us into a retreat, into much more simple lives, much more close lives, and you know, changes, changes in our world. So a lot of those changes had to do with, uh, from my community's perspective, like how we're gonna eat, how we're gonna survive. You know, not only were we on lockdown, but a lot of us, we moved on to farms. So this is where I lived during the pandemic. This is my life. This is my farm. All of those boys were no longer in school. In fact, most of the kids on my reservation were not in school. So a lot of those kids stayed home with their families. I was fortunate enough to live on a farm. And so all of these kids stayed home with me and we became people who grew food at a much higher rate. And you know, while the US had this massive destruction, I believe these are carrots, I'm not even really sure, but basically, you know, because uh, big is not great, when you have giant food systems that can't transport food. You know, they talk about the economies of scale arguments. Well, the economies of scale is not so great when you have systems that break down and you have to throw everything away, like the milk, like killing the pigs, like plowing things into the ground, or like these carrots that are here being destroyed. So what do you do? You know, so my point of this discussion is like in these times of crisis, it is a it as Erin Dottie Roy says, she says it's a a portal between one world and the next. And she says, what do you what do you want to carry through the portal? Do you want to carry your dirty, dirty rivers, your data banks, your, you know, your avarice, your hatred? Or do you want to walk through the portal clean? And to me, this pandemic this is a moment when we have an opportunity to change how we live. And so this is what we do. So first, we started looking at the fact that you ain't going to get food in a pandemic. I'm sure you all noticed that. You know, there was lines, but, you know, everywhere. But the thing is, is, you know, this is a time of prophecy. My dad used to say there'd be a time when you wouldn't get food from the store. There'd be no food in the store. That's what my dad used to say. And he was right. That's what I just saw. And the reason is, is because your grapes travel 2,100 miles your broccoli 2000 miles and uh you know maybe your you know apples 1500 miles you don't get things you want during the time of a pandemic so what you do is you get local in your food system this is my village this is us uh, harvesting wild rice you know on that same lake you saw the picture of my 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 friend there Don Goodwin and I but you know we have, we we, we strengthen our local food system and we fight to keep our wild rice so that we can keep eating that be us and then we uh 
look at if you look at this chart, you see like the, one of the largest increases in in any in, in any economic sector was that of building materials, garden materials, nursing, and garden stores. Now people decide that they all should garden because uh, they're all home anyway, and so there was a I think it was a, a four times larger number of people that uh, gardened in 20, 2020 and 2021 uh, than previously because they were all home. And so what we did learn is we learned that we should learn how to grow food. And a lot of us did grow food. This is us in my village. That's one of my granddaughters. That's some of our food that we grow. We've been growing a long time, you know, but we keep growing food. We keep growing more food. This is some of our cool squash. That's actually going to Omni or the sous chef restaurant down in Minneapolis because we grow for them too. Those are Lakota squash. Grow your own food, grow local. You'll have a better chance. Your health will increase. Your health uh, disparities will diminish and your health will be better. Uh, you'll be a lot happier. You know, so we learned that during the pandemic. We knew that before, but it sharpened up. This is us with our post-petroleum food system, which is a couple of horses and in a field. And then remember to have hope for this, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that Beth was talking about the 80% of the food comes from, you know, indigenous peoples, you know, think about it, you know, some of our seeds are so old, and they're still good seeds, you know, you could bring them to life. Um, we, you know, doubled our effort to create solar thermal in our villages, so that the stress factors of lack of access to heat security were diminished. And so this is up putting solar thermal panels up on our village. And this is us making them same solar thermal panels. We produce those there on the White Earth Reservation. That's uh, one of my sons there on the left making the solar thermal panels. And uh, here they are, they make you warm. And these these kids being all warm. And then uh, we put more solar up because we realized that, you know, all of these risk factors were, uh, what would you say, became much more apparent during COVID. You can't get parts for anything. You can't get energy. You know, so a lot of our tribes, this is Red Lake Nation, putting up a fabulous solar project. And this is the guy who did it. His name is uh, Solar Bear Bob Lake. Uh, you know, so our community, I think, really upped our bar in self-sufficiency because we didn't trust anybody who's going to take care of us. Here's our last couple of slides. Here's us growing some hemp. And, uh, you know, what I really want to point out, here's some hemp insulation, is that another big contributing factor of risk in our communities today is that lack of access to adequate housing. This is hemp housing, has a R factor of about R19, R16. You can make it out of stuff you could grow, you know, right there at why you sequester carbon. And, uh, you know, so that's what we are doing in our community is trying to rebuild resilient, you know, resilient pathways ahead. And, um, you know, I call this the sitting bull plan. Um, you know, there's the Green New Deal and there's, uh, I think it's called the um, Leap Manifesto in Canada. I call it the Sitting Bull Plan because he was a great leader who said, let us put our minds together, see what kind of future we can make for our children. And, you know, in this moment of time when we have these lessons, you know, it is a good thing to know that we are, we're really all related and we have an opportunity to do something epic and we have an opportunity to change and make something that's beautiful with a lot less stress for our communities. So I'll uh, thank you for your time. There's my uh, presentation and uh, happy to happy to be here to answer any questions and happy to be with Matthew and Noreen and Beth. Thank you all so much for those really incredible and moving presentations. Um, as Winona Lejik just mentioned, we do have time for a couple of questions. So if our participants would go ahead and please use the Q&A function to type questions into the chat in the interim while this, this is happening, I wanted to ask if any of our um, other panelists wanted to respond to anything that they heard during the, the other presentations. I thought these flowed really beautifully together, but I thought I'd give you all the opportunity to engage if there was something else. Well, you know, one observation, this this speaks to Winona's comments and Noreen's presentation too, was that years ago I was sitting with my mom and we were looking through old family photograph albums. And there was a picture of this church gathering. And my mom looked at it and she said, you know, and this was picture was taken in the early 1920s. She said, you know, you just didn't see fat Indians back then. <laughs>
And, you know, and it really speaks to the changes in diet and all of the comorbidities that go with that change, those changes in diet, uh, obesity, diabetes, heart disease. Um, it's, it's, it's really striking. All right, well, perhaps while we wait for some um, questions to come in, one of the things that really jumped out about this, this presentation order, um, Matt, you provided us with a really comprehensive, I'm sorry, Matthew Snip, you provided us with a really comprehensive overview of the laws, the policies, the structures that have created these vulnerabilities for contemporary Native people. Um, Noreen Goldman, you gave us a very compelling overview of the, the precise impact. We could see that during COVID on you know, health across Native populations for people on and off reservation. And I think in particular, your focus on the, the impact of this for Native youth is so striking in this moment. Um, Beth Redbird, you kind of took us back to look at the, the constitutional groundings, to look at contemporary Native people. And I really appreciated your focus on how now is a moment, right? I think both um, Winona LaDuke and Beth, you know, we often think of this moment as, or we often talk about, you know, crisis and apocalypse, and this is terrible and horrible. And I really appreciated the way that you all are both looking at care and future and potentials and things that Native peoples and Native nations are doing right now, you know, to build these better futures, even in the midst of times of crisis. And um, Winona, as you said, your son said, right, we have this real sensibility of our peoples have been here, as Kim Talbear says, many times before, right, we've lived through the apocalypse, um, and this is kind of what's happening. And so I just wanted to invite y'all to talk a little bit more about um, some of the, the efforts of current caretaking, however that manifests as food, as tribal sovereignty initiatives, as responses to health crises, you know, on reservations and off reservations that you've seen that you've been really inspired by, you know, watching Native people not just experience the pandemic, but respond to the pandemic in these kind of beautiful and innovative ways. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to talk unless we know did you wanna say something? I think that one of the key things in you see it across native nations, this idea of relations and being related means that uh, tribal peoples across the continent often feel like we have a commitment not just to our own communities, but to the communities that touch on ours and surround us. And I think you really saw that a lot in the pandemic with actions exactly like what I know was talking about this idea of we grow food locally and we'll share. And we have knowledge locally and we'll share. And the I think in some respects, the pandemic brought out the worst in us in many ways, but I also think it, brought us together and it taught us what at least Indians have been saying for a long time, which is we are all related and we're all interconnected and the well-being of one matters for the well-being of us all. And that, I don't know, I found that to be really inspirational when I was back home too during the pandemic. I'd, I'd like to add a comment to that about something that really impressed me. And that was the issue of the success of the vaccination uh, campaign in, among Native Americans, because if any group had lots of reasons to distrust whatever was being promoted by the national government, um, the Native Americans certainly had that reason. And yet uh, they became a model of how tribal elders could convince people about how this was the important way to preserve their lives, preserve their cultures. Um, I was uh, somewhat amused. Um, I also live uh, part-time in Canada. We had Canadian friends who were very frustrated. They couldn't get vaccines. Canada was very slow and, and made their purchase in a way that put them very low down the, the totem pole in getting vaccines from the US. And they live in Calgary, pretty close to the Montana border. The Blackfeet Reservation had vaccinated virtually all of its people and offered the surplus to people in Alberta. <laughs> and so lo and behold, our friends drove down um, to the U.S. border, were not allowed to get out of the car, otherwise they would have been quarantined by the Canadian government, you know, came in, got vaccines, um, and went back to Calgary and Canada. And that, that was just a really impressive story, both of their success and of their sharing. Um, 
Thanks for thanks for sharing that. I want to say that in our community too, like one, just on that that um, one point, Noreen, we vaccinated us, and then we vaccinated all our neighbors who hated us. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, Indians probably well, those guys, I saw people that are getting vaccinated by the Indians who like have, have never spoken a word to an Indian person. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> but I thought we were just like, you know, we're going to get it from you because you guys don't have it together. So we vaccinated them all. You know, you could get a vaccination from the tribe, but I thought that was great. The other thing, just kind of from my point of view, which I think you saw in my presentation, like we just stayed outside. You know, I mean, first of all, I was a water protector, so I was risking arrest quite often. But I spent most of the last, you know, during the pandemic, I spent like eight months outside. We are much healthier. We are much more athletic, you know. And then I, we took our kids out, too, because, I mean, they were out of school anyway. So we just, you know, that's how we cared for ourselves as we stayed outside and we stayed physically active and felt like way better, you know, and uh, didn't go to town anyway. You know, so I felt like that there's a lot of people that develop different survival mechanisms, and, um, you know, some of us too, like, I think that, you know, when I get stressed out, sometimes I just plant another row of a vegetable in the garden. <laughs> I'm like, oh, they're bombing the Ukraine. Here, let me plant some more dill. <laughs> there is a question in the Q&A. Yeah, so we're starting to have some um, some questions in the chat. Um, the, the first one that came in here is a question about ICWA and futures for native, um, populations. The, uh, attendee asks, is there worry about future indigenous population growth if the Supreme Court reverses the Native American adoption case on race and tribal sovereignty? And just for our listeners, the context here is that in the 1970s, after hard fought battles by activists, um, to keep Native children from being forcibly removed from their families and homes, which was very common in the 1950s and 1960s, with some reservation communities experiencing half of all Native children taken forcibly from their homes due to assessments that their upbringing was unfit. The Indian Child Welfare Act was designed to protect Native people and make sure that Native children were had first the option to be adopted by other Native people before being adopted outside of the community, and that's currently before the Supreme Court. So um, to our panelists, are we concerned? Are there things you've seen happening? You know, what is kind of your perspective on, on this right now? Well, you know, um, if ICWA is ruled unconstitutional, uh, it'll be a setback without a doubt and, and a, a further attack on tribal sovereignty. But at the same time, uh, we have a generation of younger uh, tribal leaders who are better educated, more knowledgeable, better experienced, and have the capacity to fight back in a way that we didn't back in the 50s and 60s. In the 1950s and 60s, it was very, very difficult to find an, an, an American Indian lawyer of any kind. That has changed. Um, in fact, sometimes I think we have too many lawyers in Indian country. But nonetheless, um, I think what you will see is you will see these communities fighting back. Uh, they will go to court, and with or without ICWA, uh, they're going to they're they're going to prevent many of these adoptions from happening. But without a doubt, it is a setback. I will make the argument for the demographers in the room, and I've made it many times before, which is when we think about the history of kind of American Indian law and assimilation policy, we often think about land and sovereignty for really obvious and important reasons. But I think that the, the mechanism that has been deployed in almost all of those cases has been aimed at the Indian family. It's been aimed at Indian children and moving native peoples onto this idea of the nuclear family as the primary source of native organization away from tribe, away from interconnected large relationships. And so the, the result of that has been a legal burden that has often fallen on our children. And I think this is no exception to that. And I'm really optimistic to hear Matt say that because um, I 
there are stories from the red power era, but I don't have, of course, any memory of that. And so I find it to be really upsetting and discouraging to see the Supreme Court back at another ICWA challenge. Um, and I'm really optimistic seeing states like Illinois step up and say, you know what, if the federal government won't protect ICWA, we will, at least at the state level. Excellent. Thank you all so much. So I think we have time just for about one more question. And so the next um, question in the chat is sort of a big open-ended policy question. This might be something good to end on because it kind of asks, you know, everyone what what in a what they would like to see moving forward. So the attendee asks, what would it take to change the marginalization of Native Americans? What can the Biden administration do, for example, in the next two years to create change? And I'll actually just expand that out to say, what would you like to see um, happening? I know uh, several of y'all have already talked about exciting things happening now and, you know, potential, but what are some, some things you'd like to see going forward? Well, you know, I mean, there's all kind of things that could be done. Uh, no absence of, of ways to do better. <laughs> I mean, you could start with land back. That's awesome. You know, return and, uh, and protection of a lot of the sacred sites that are under assault. You know, uh, full and adequate funding for health services, education programs, infrastructure needs of tribal communities, which are all underserved you know, and have pathetic infrastructure, as does my community. You know, um, those are just the beginning, but then also kind of taking that the boot off our neck so that we can undertake really critical, you know, land-based sustainability work, uh, whether it is through hemp, wind, food, or, you know, whatever it is that our, our nations are doing and really capitalizing to ensure that the next economy has us at the table, not on the menu. You know, th those are, you know, some of the facets of, of what could happen. But, you know, I, I you know, obviously much better th this president than the last one. Uh, but, you know, very much a, a challenge remains because never has been a, a very kind relationship. Although you're right, Matthew, that uh, surprisingly enough, Nixon was one of the most most be benevolent presidents towards Native people, you know. Anyway, I'll let the other panelists, you know, continue on, but thank you again for the opportunity to visit. I just add a small point to that laundry list that I agree with of what could be done. And that small point is better data collection. So we have a better sense of what the impacts are, where the deficits are, of what whether things are improving or getting worse um, and data sharing. Well, I'll add my two cents and first of all, begin by uh, thanking the Office of Population Research at Princeton for organizing this uh, session. But I guess um, to, to put another concern out there is one of the things that I've been worried about lately is that there's enormous inequality that's growing out there in any country. You have tribes that are doing extraordinarily well the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma is the largest employer in northeastern Oklahoma, uh, about 13,000 employees. Uh, but then you also have tribes like the um, Cheyenne River that are isolated far from population centers and are still struggling. And so if I had a, if I had a wish list, I would look for ways to narrowing the gap between uh, our, our our tribal brethren who are doing quite well for themselves and the communities that are, are being left behind. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure no one else want to jump in on that. I am Thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us here this evening and for sharing these really
moving and informative, um, wonderful presentations. It was an honor to be here with you all. Um, thank you to our attendees for turning out to listen to this very important conversation. And again, thank you to the Office of Population Research at Princeton University for hosting this conversation. Um, we look forward to hopefully seeing you all for future talks and events. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.